Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar. I'm Rosanna Francescato, Communications Director with the Clean Coalition. We're excited today to host this webinar on solar microgrids and community microgrids and their tremendous resilience benefits. So a few quick housekeeping items. We will email everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. Also, all of our webinars are archived on our website, clean-coalition.org, under events. If you have questions at any time during the webinar, please go ahead and type them in the question pane at the right of your screen. We will answer as many questions as we can during the Q&A, which will follow the presentation. And if you have any questions about the Clean Coalition, you can contact me at rosanna at clean-coalition.org. Now, before we get into our main presentations, I want to set the stage for today's webinar. First, I want to cover who the Clean Coalition is and what we're about. The Clean Coalition is a nonprofit organization, and our mission is to accelerate the transition to renewable energy and a modern grid. Our end game vision is that we will get to 100% renewable energy within the next two decades. And at the Clean Coalition, we're focused on the 25% of that end game that we believe needs to come from local renewable sources. I should say at least 25%. In some places, it will be more. And local means you're interconnected within the distribution grid where people live and work, and you're facilitating resilience, which is possible because you're avoiding dependence on long transmission lines. Now, I want to clarify that the Clean Coalition does believe that we'll still need to get up to 75% of our energy from remote sources. But local renewables provide significant benefits that remote renewables just can't provide. And a major one of those is resilience. Resilience, it turns out, is an extremely valuable benefit. And Everyone understands that there's significant value to the resilience provided by indefinite renewables driven backup power, especially for the most critical electricity loads. And this is a resilience that we can get from solar microgrids and community microgrids like the ones we'll discuss today. But when you ask people how much this resilience is worth, no one really has an answer. And that means there's a substantial economic gap for renewables driven microgrids. So to address this gap, the Clean Coalition has developed a straightforward value of resilience methodology, which we call VOR123. And with VOR123, we can quantify the value of renewables-driven resilience at any type of facility in any location. VOR123 shows that premiums make sense for indefinite renewables-driven backup power. And you may have guessed from the name of this methodology, the key to VOR123 is tiering loads. And that's because different loads have different values. So VOR123 standardizes resilience values for three tiers of loads, again, regardless of facility type or location. Tier one is usually about 10% of the load, and these are mission critical life-sustaining loads that really warrant 100% resilience. Tier two or priority loads are usually about 15% of the load. And these should be maintained as long as doing so does not threaten the ability to maintain tier one loads. And tier three are the rest of the loads, discretionary loads that are usually about 75% of the total. Tier three loads are maintained only when doing so does not threaten tier one and two resilience. Now, these are typical load percentages. They may vary from facility to facility, but the same principles apply. And based on these typical loads, this slide shows the percentage of time we can keep tier one, two, and three loads online for a typical solar microgrid in California that decides to achieve net zero energy. As the chart shows, for a typical solar microgrid, tier one loads can be kept online 100% of the time. That's how we size them. Tier two loads can be kept online at least 80% of the time. And tier three loads can be kept online at least 25% of the time. And this is you know, in the worst solar conditions. So if, if there's a lot of sun, they can be kept online even longer. So based on this tiering system, the Clean Coalition has determined that a site should be willing to pay a premium of 25% for the extremely valuable resilience benefit. And we validated this 25% adder using four approaches. You can learn more about these at the link provided here. You know, we could do, and we have done, whole webinars on this. Um, but I, want, I don't want to take up the whole time. So there's more at the link. Um, and we have also applied 
VOR123 to real world projects like the solar microgrids for the Santa Barbara Unified School District or SBUSD. And that's one of the case studies we'll cover today. And the SBUSD is getting significant resilience benefits for free, as you can see here. So although a facility should be willing to pay 25% more, many can get it for less or even for free. And this was through a PPA. Now, people ask, how can we apply VOR123 to a larger grid area? And the answer is that we can use the same VOR123 principles that work for an individual facility for a larger grid area. So the facilities within a grid area can be tiered in a similar manner to loads within a facility based on how critical a facility is to a community. And the top emphasis will be to ensure 100% resilience for tier one loads at tier one facilities, followed by the tier one loads at other facilities and tier two loads at critical community facilities, which are tier one. So this chart shows how it works. Here, the dark green square indicates loads that are critical for the entire community, such as tier one loads at tier one facilities like fire stations. The light green squares are priority for the entire community. The yellow squares are priority for individual facilities, but not the entire community. And the gray squares represent discretionary loads. So how is this paid for? Well, for critical community facilities, the community microgrid cost should be rate-based on a cost of service basis, just like the cost of every other grid asset that serves the community at large. And that's because these critical community facilities are providing valuable benefits to the community, like fire stations, emergency shelters, water districts and so on. So community microgrid cost of service can be rate based for tier one loads and potentially tier two loads at critical community facilities and at other facilities that are deemed to be tier one for the community and maybe even at tier two facilities that provide important community benefits. Now, the way the Clean Coalition designs microgrids, the facilities that host solar microgrids as part of a community microgrid are guaranteed specific levels of resilience during grid outages. But other facilities within a community microgrid area don't have that guarantee. So these other facilities can subscribe for resilience from the community microgrid via a market mechanism that the Clean Coalition is proposing. We call that the Resilient Energy Subscription, or RES. And for that, they will get guaranteed allocations of daily energy during islanded operations. So in California, res fees are expected to add about 1% to facilities electric bill for every 1% of normal load that's reserved for guaranteed daily energy delivery. As an example, if a bank decides it wants to reserve 10% of its normal load, which as we saw is about the average tier one load for commercial facilities, then the bank will pay a res fee of about 10%, uh, a 10% increase to its electricity bill. And the bank's res fees will cover the cost of service that will allow the community microgrid owner operator to increase the capacity of the community microgrid to cover not just what the community microgrid needs for resilience, but also the bank's resilient energy subscription. Now, I know this is a lot of information. You can read more about VOR123 at the link shown here. And in the near future, we're also gonna publish a blog post explaining more about our res proposal. So now I'd like to get into the rest of our webinar so you can see some great examples of solar microgrids and community microgrids that are already in the works. And all of these projects will provide significant resilience benefits. Some of them have already been deployed. We have three excellent presenters with us today, all from NG North America. Rachel Permit is Director, Solution Innovation. She's responsible for solutions innovation for energy solutions across NG North America working cross-functionally with sales, engineering, operations, legal, and finance. Neil Bartek is project director at Microgrids. He works with the project teams to review both the technical and the financial components of proposed microgrids to provide recommendations to optimize solutions. And Margaret Miller is director of government and regulatory affairs. She's responsible for advising the company on regulatory and policy matters in organized and bilateral electricity markets across the Western US. You can read more about our presenters on the event listing for this webinar on our website. And we will send everyone the link to that, which will include the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. So now I'm gonna turn it over to the NG folks to continue our presentations. Thanks, Rosanna. While Anna's pulling up the slides, 
Um, I'm Rachel Permit, and I will be discussing uh, a brief introduction to how to approach microgrids from a general standpoint. Um, and then we'll be going into five different case studies that Neil Bartek will walk us through, um, followed by um, Margaret Miller um, on some of the policy work that's going on in this area that will allow um, us to um, further our efforts around community microgrids. Um, as of today, it's very challenging to have more than one building have a microgrid on um, the way the, the rules are set up in California specifically. Um, but that is something both NG and the Clean Coalition are advocating for um, to increase the amount of resilience a community can have across um, a number of buildings. So um, one of the things that uh, microgrids uh, have been known as is um, for local resiliency benefits, as Rosanna was mentioning, um, one of the things that we at NG are really focused on is the community impact of all of our projects. And um, due to the increased number of power outages and public safety power shutoffs, um, we have wanted to help our communities um, become more resilient. So today we're going to look at the landscape of projects across five communities in Northern, Central, and Southern California, and how we've increased not only the resiliency for those individual sites, but the community at large. Next. Yeah. So we're going to start with, as I mentioned, a general approach to thinking about a microgrid project, um, five different case studies, um, and then from there, we'll be looking at what policies are in place and maybe how you as stakeholders can support um, uh, these initiatives. And then we'll have time left for Q&A. So first, um, the, we want to, one of the things that we often hear in the market is customers saying, I want a backup generator or I want solar and storage to back up my unit. And what we really recommend is that rather than thinking about the technology first, we really look at your values, what your goals are with that project, what level of energy resiliency you need or want, what your the economic goals are, and if you have any sustainability targets um, as a corporation or um, organization that you're trying to meet, because that really drives um, what is actually viable um, and the right combination of solutions for you. We also need to look at your individual site. While there is generalities that we can make um, with the rules of thumb that, that the Clean Coalition has recommended, we do want to understand your energy use um, and your site attributes. And when you combine those goals and your current state, we can come up with a portfolio of technology options that leads to that optimal solution for you and your site. Um, so we really recommend it's worth, it's a, it's a bit of extra homework, but we really think it leads to um, a better outcome um, for you, for your operations as these are 10 or 20 year um, projects. Um, next, thanks. So what do you need to think about when you're thinking about sizing the energy resiliency? Um, it is, um, there are a couple different factors. The first is how much load do you need backed up? Um, are you just trying to get your front office and phone and IT systems? Um, do you have a cafeteria or a gym or community space that you want people to be able to congregate in or a cooling center? Um, is the whole building, do you really need to be up and fully operational? Or in some cases you have a campus with multiple sites. So the amount of load that is um, required to be backed up will definitely affect what type of technologies um, that we want to put forward. The second variable is the duration. Um, do you just need it for a couple seconds or minutes um, to ride through a blip on the grid because you're at the end of a line? Or do you have those um, risk of fire or PSPS events where you're at the other end of the spectrum um, where you're looking for multiple days of duration from your backup system? And then what is it worth to you? Um, what are your economic requirements? We have customers where they don't have the, the funding and they're looking to do this through a PPA and they're looking for savings on day one. Um, that is a case where there's still possibilities for economic um, sustain, uh, resiliency, but those are a lot rarer and there's a lot less load that can be backed up in those situations. But maybe for you, it's, it's an imperative and it's reliable at any cost or it's probably somewhere in the middle. Um, and that's where the uh, value of resiliency one, two, three um, methodology comes into place of, of really trying to understand 
how important it is to you um, and what's that worth. So the next set of factors that drive the project economics um, are the size and the complexity of the project. So this is a case where it's not just um, the, the variables that we looked at on the simple, it's the larger the load, you may need to upgrade some of your electrical infrastructure, like your transformers or the switch gear. Um, do you want to have a flexible load? Um, you want to decrease the amount of, of, of generation that's added um, by making your actual HVAC or lighting more flexible. Um, maybe you don't want to back up the whole building because that's not cost effective um, for what your goals are. And so you, um, we need to separate it and add a critical load panel. So there's just other things that drive the economics that are not purely driven by the size um, of the amount of load or the duration that you're trying to back up. So what are we looking at here? So you have a number of options. Um, at NG, we are a believer in re a renewable centric microgrid where we do start try to start with solar and battery energy storage as the first building blocks. But we'll also look at fuel cells, um, combined heat and power, um, natural gas generators or diesel generators if, if, if we have to. Um, so there is a multitude of technologies that we have at your disposal. Then we can look at the customer facility. Um, and we were talking about as the next set of variables is what about your site? What do we need to know about it to be able to develop that project um, to meet what your actual goals are? So there's certain things that are, what are your current assets that are on site? What is your build? How does your building operate? Those are things that we need to take into account. Then we need to look at your space. Do you have room for a solar um, on-site solar? What does um, incentives are available? And then what are those technologies of that portfolio um, meet your goals? Um, and from there, we can go into what we consider to be a renewable energy microgrid. So in this case, this is just a, a, a pictorial map markup for a school in this case, um, where we're trying to back up the lighting and the HVAC, their communications and IT. Um, they are essential, they are in this case a emergency shelter for cooling and for the community. Um, and we want to keep the food um, safe and, and fresh. And so um, we have that um, as uh, the refrigeration and as backed up as well. And as you can see here, the utility grid is out and we have some solar and storage that are funding, uh, that are sourcing the power for the buildings. Um, but last but not least, I don't want to leave without saying, compared to a normal solar and storage project, there are some um, additional considerations to think about. Um, there is routine service additional beyond what you would be doing for your solar storage assets. Um, we recommend quarterly and annual preventative maintenance. Um, this is to give you confidence and we can get into more details if you have specific questions about a project, um, what that actually looks like. But the goal here is to give you confidence that, um, that you're ready for an outage and that you know how much you can um, expect to run um, between those high risk months. Um, then we move into event related services. So let's say there is an event on how did event that happens. We want to work with you to make sure that you know what did happen, how did the assets perform, um, make sure that everyone is aware of that. And then we want to look at implementing any lessons learned for the, the next outage event. Um, we can all there's always room for improvement. So that is the generic version of what we think about when we are proposing a, a resilient microgrid solution. And from here, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Neil Bartek, to walk you through five um, actual projects and how those kind of philosophy um, and of energy resiliency um, came into practice. Thanks, Rachel. So again, I'm Neil Bartek, and for my portion, as I said, I'll be going through a few different versions of community microgrids. So on, on this slide, I don't want to dwell on this, but you know, as a society, we're becoming more and more reliant upon a safe, clean, and reliable source of electricity. And you know, we'd be remiss if we didn't at least mention that you know, power disruptions are on the rise, whether they'd be the result of you know, public safety power shutoffs, or increasingly severe weather events. They're, they're happening, they're happening more frequently, and they're having a larger impact on us as a society. 
So, you know, we need to be prepared to, to deal with these. Uh, so next slide. Um, you know, when we think of the impact of these power outages, we oftentimes go to the economic issues like lost production, forced overtime, or, you know, or the like. But the true impact of these power outages can go much deeper and be much harder, harder to fully quantify. You know, things such as physical health impacts and lower air quality from, you know, the operation of backup diesel generators, mental and emotional health of, of students, you know, who are unable to, to go to school and have their daily lives kind of disrupted, and, uh, you know, child care and security. These are all things that you know, are potentially impacted by these outages. So on the next slide here, this is that same kind of school example that Rachel had Hold up, um, and it's really, you know, it's just a, some feedback that we've gotten from some schools as to what they consider to be some of the larger impacts of a power outage. You know, Rachel touched on the food service. You know, if if they lose power for a certain amount of time, they may lose thirty, fifty thousand dollars worth of food that they have in their in their cafeterias. Their information technology, they can't contact parents and, and provide updates as to what's happening and and then their communication systems go down. Not to mention as we're electrifying our, our bus fleets and things like that, well, now we can't charge buses. Um, so just, you know, all impacts. And this is just amplified throughout society, you know, for, you know, depending on what your business or your, your operations are. So now I'll dive into some case studies here on the next slide. Uh, this first one is, is with the Anza Electric Co-op. Uh, this is kind of your traditional view of a community microgrid as it is owned and operated by the utility, by Anza Electric. Uh, so Anza Electric has, they're here in Southern California, they have limited interconnections electrically to the outside grid. And uh, this was kind of brought home in 2017 as the community was shut off a few times as a result of wildfire events. And one of these events actually destroyed uh, the major transmission line that fed the community. And as a result, they were out of power for 10 days as this line was rebuilt. Uh, so we've worked with, with Anza Electric and this microgrid that they have now is, has about 5.4 megawatts of capacity. You can see in the picture there, there's a um, the snapshot of the site where there's 3.4 megawatts of ground mounted solar with a two megawatt, four megawatt hour battery uh, that's tied in as well. And we're actually in the process now of doubling the amount of battery energy storage at the site. Uh, these resources connect directly into the ANZA electric substation. And so once this power is in the substation, it can be directed to critical loads across ANZA's existing electrical infrastructure. So you see some of the community benefits uh, listed here on the slide. You know, so obviously this is a clean, renewable energy source right in the heart of the community. Um, provides resilient power source to their downtown area, which includes key businesses such as gas stations, restaurants, and a fire station. And you know, this is a, a more rural community, so they a lot of the residents. Well, all the residents have well water, and so ha them having power, is, you know, enables them to keep pumping water and, and having access to water as well. Uh, so on the next slide, one of the factors here is um, for each of these case studies, we'll kind of get the design, and then we'll also talk a little bit about something a little bit more in depth about that project. And this one is it's about the testing. So. For solar, you know, solar uh, typical behind the meter solar plus storage testing is, is one thing, but when we do a microgrid now, there's much more testing that's involved to make sure that everything is operating. Uh, in this case, there were the typical device-to-device -device communications that we have on all the projects, but in this case, we also integrated with the customer SCADA system and with their operations center in Arizona, so that, that required additional testing uh, for the typical on-grid functionality of the battery and the solar, you know, that needed to be coordinated with the anticipated loading on the system. 
you know, ANSA has several thousand customers that, and we don't have control over how they're using power. So we needed to coordinate testing with the weather, with the expected uh, loading on the system, and all of those sorts of things. Uh, Off-grid functionality, so that's another sort of testing you have to add for microgrids. And, you know, we had to test, you know, as best as possible, kind of isolate it from the system. So we did have the solar and the energy storage where we could isolate it and kind of test it on its own as best we could. And then when we had those kinks worked out, then we could connect it to the larger grid and, and do those testings. Uh, an important thing on, on this type of community microgrid, you know, we're not just doing a behind the meter system. Now, when we do testing on the system, it's potentially impacting thousands of customers. And so those outages have to be coordinated with the community, you know, and communicate it well in advance so they would understand what was happening and what the potential impacts were. Uh, so on the next slide, we go to our next uh, case study here. And this is with Adventist Health uh, Feather River site. So after the 2018 campfire, uh, that heavily damaged Adventist Health's Feather River Center, and, and this is in Paradise, California. The hospital administration uh, was committed to providing a better reliability to the community with new solutions that would allow them to be fully operational during future power outages. So we, we, we were, we're doing a much larger uh, portfolio-wide project with Adventist Health where we're installing around 12 megawatts of solar across 28 of their sites here in California. But this Feather River site, they have you know, special reliability needs because of what we've seen in the past with these impacts from fires. And so we've designed this, and this one's actually mechanically complete. We're going through the final stages of testing here, but it has about 800 kW of capacity, which includes about 360 kW of solar, a 232 kW, basically one megawatt hour battery, and a 250 kW backup generator. So all these resources are, are integrated in, you know, behind the meter here. And on a normal day like today, they're providing uh, bill savings from the customer. The, the battery is shaving peak demand. The solar is producing power, offsetting utility purchases. And then if there is a power outage, it's, the system is able to separate it from the, from the utility grid and provide full operational capability to the site. On the, so that's um, the most important piece of that is maintaining you know, full operations of this medical facility for the community. And on the next slide, it talks a little bit about you know, working with a, a customer such as Adventist Health, where they have many different levels of stakeholders. You know, there's many teams within Adventist Health, from their real estate department to their corporate team, and, and there's on-site operations and maintenance. And then they also have, uh, in this case, uh, Office of Emergency Services, where you know, you need to coordinate with them and make sure that you're providing timely updates and both on the design as well as through the implementation phase so that folks understand um, what the capabilities of the site are and what and you're kind of managing those expect, expectations throughout the project life cycle. <laughs> Quickly moving on to the next case study here. Um, this is Santa Barbara Unified School District. So Rosanna touched on this one earlier, earlier on, but this is a, a Santa Barbara is a so, Southern California school district with 15,000 students, faculty, and staff. So in this case, um, one of the big drivers was the 2017 and 18 Thomas fire. And after this, the staff, the district staff started looking in, into energy resiliency options. They wanted to preserve critical operations during these emergencies and you know future power outages. So as for this design, again, it's a larger portfolio of projects that are installing about 4.2 megawatts of solar across 14 campuses. But these microgrids have been identified for six of the campuses, and they will include 
two and a half megawatts of solar, uh, almost two megawatts of batteries, and about four megawatt hours. Um, and one of the key features here is this included the VOR123 methodology Rosanna mentioned as far as identifying key uh, critical loads for the customer so that we're able to, because there is no backup generators, there are no backup generators at these sites. So we want to be able to extend the life of these solar and energy storage microgrids. So we'll, when there's power outage, we'll serve the entire campus. When the batteries get to a lower state of charge, we'll isolate just the critical loads to, to extend their life. And then if, if the solar is overproducing and we're charging the battery back up, we can bring the rest of the campus back up. Uh, and then hopefully, and then not, you know, before too long, the grid comes back and we can tie back into the grid. Um, on the next slide, we talked a little bit about um, just the vision they had and the strong partnership. So again, they used the district had partnered with a strong team of consultants, including the Clean Coalition and, and Sage Renewables, and they had this use this VOR one two three methodology to really you know create this vision across the community as far as the value these these solar these solar plus storage microgrids could bring to the community. And you can see in the map there how these schools are are uh, dispersed across the community. So it's it's a, a good resource where you know folks know where their local school is. They can go there in a time of, of emergency. And the other key here is the district wanted a, a long-term partner, somebody that was able to not only build these systems but build, own, and maintain these systems for you know an extended period of time. Okay, moving on to the next slide. Uh, Solana County. So Solana County is home to nearly 500,000 residents in Northern California, and it's been severely impacted by wildfires in recent years. Um, so these microgrids are actually part of a comprehensive energy program for the county, and microgrids are being developed at four key locations, which you can see listed here: the Bep Campus, the Downtown Campus, Vallejo Campus, and at Fairfield Library. In total, these microgrids will have about 2.3 megawatts of solar and then 2 megawatts or nearly 8 megawatt hours of batteries. And you know, these, are many, these are all existing campuses, some of which have existing backup generators. So where possible, we are incorporating the existing backup generators into these microgrids as well. So these, these microgrids will provide, uh, help maintain critical community county operations throughout you know, PSPS events and other utility outages. They'll reduce utility expenses and exposure to you know, rising utility rates. And then there's also a community engagement, which goes with a lot of these projects. Like in this case, there will be real-time dashboards in many of these buildings for where the community is able to, to view the, the benefit of these, of these resources and the projects that the county is doing. And another good feature with this project as well is that there are workforce development activities. So everything from the juvenile court community programs to uh, summer camps where they're doing things. On the next slide, we talk a little bit about you know, site selection. So again, this was part of a, a larger, broader, comprehensive energy program for the county looking at everything from new lighting to uh, upgrading HVAC systems and EV charging stations. And so going through this analysis, we were able to uh, identify the best locations for microgrids as far as those locations that would have the highest utility savings and be able to provide some of the biggest benefits to the community with these, um, that, you know, with, by maintaining their critical operations. So the next slide has our final uh, case study here. So apologies, but this is a, a, and it's more of the infrastructure side of things. So a little bit different spin than what we've been looking at, but this is a soon to be announced water district in Southern California, where in this case, we're constructing 19.3 megawatts of microgrids at key water and wastewater facilities. So they'll have 
nearly 13 megawatts of solar, uh, more than three megawatts of battery energy storage, and another three megawatts of backup generation. And so these uh, these microgrids will be key to maintaining critical water and wastewater operations during utility outages. They're, um, you know, they'll help maintain safe water supply and prevent the overflow of wastewater into, you know, sensitive environmental areas. And on the next slide, just one last slide on this is, um, you know, in this case, it's a very forward looking water district where they're taking a, a proactive approach to the the now famous water energy nexus. And you know, by doing these projects, they'll be able to lower their utility expenses and obviously have that protection from long-term uh, utility rates rising through these long-term agreements. And they're also creating these on-site clean, resilient power sources for their critical operations. And that competes my portion of the presentation. So I'd like to hand things over to Margaret Miller. Hi, good morning, everybody. I'm going to touch on some of the key regulatory and policy initiatives that are ongoing in the microgrid space. I'm going to talk about, you know, as a non-utility developer of microgrids, where we would like to see the rules and policy go. I'm going to give an overview of you know, the progress that um, has been made to date as far as expanding the uh, commercialization of microgrids and also what's going on um, in, in the California legislature currently, which isn't a lot to be honest, but I'm going to touch on what, what there is um, still active. So I want to start off by uh, touching on SB 1139, which was passed and signed into law in September 2018, and that is um, was authored by Senator Stern. And this was really a pivotal piece of legislation for the microgrid space in that it directed the California Public Utilities Commission to take specific steps to, facil to facilitate the commercializations of microgrids by removing barriers to development and creating separate rates and tariffs for microgrids. So really the intent of SB 1139 was to advance microgrids from pilot status to a commercial product that's available to customers. When this bill was passed and signed into law, we hadn't even had the most catastrophic wildfires and nor had we had PSPS events yet. So from the time that this bill was signed into law and the time that the CPUC opened its uh, rulemaking to implement SB 1139, we had a lot of, um, we had the catastrophic campfire happen and we had our first PSPS events, which further highlighted the value that microgrids can provide and customers are you know, increasingly seeking resiliency solutions in the form of microgrids. Um, before I get into kind of what has happened with the CPUC rulemaking, I wanted to touch on, you know, as a developer of microgrids, a non-utility developer, where we'd like to see policy and rules develop. Um, we'd like to see a standardized microgrid tariff that accommodates a broad set of technology types that could constitute a microgrid and the opportunity to be compensated for grid services that microgrids can provide, such as resilience, such as capacity, um, potentially for islanding and other uh, services that microgrids can provide. And where it makes sense to also provide wholesale energy market products and services to the electric system. Currently, there is no formal um, compensation or tariff that compensates uh, microgrids for providing resiliency services. And as the Clean Coalition mentioned at the beginning of this presentation, they are um, proposing some um, options to address that. We would also like to see the rules and policies to evolve to allow third parties to build, own, and operate more complex microgrids that, that provide increased resiliency benefits involving uh, multiple customers. Um, Right now, as Rachel mentioned at the beginning, we are limited by what is known as, what you've probably heard is called the over the fence rule, and that's in utility code section 218. 
which essentially requires any entity that wishes to sell power to more than two contiguous parcels or to, to parcels across the street to become in effect a utility. So that's a barrier that we would want to continue to work through to allow us to develop more complex microgrids in the future. So in response to the um, legislation, the CPUC did open a rulemaking in September of 2019. Um, we have gone through, completed three tracks within that rulemaking, and I'll touch on you know, some of the key issues that were addressed in those tracks that have moved the ball forward, you know, not as far as we would like, but we've made, we've made some progress. Um, the CPUC did amend the scope of the proceeding to include resiliency strategies as a result of the wildfires and PSP events that occurred um, in between the time the bill was released and the time that the, um, the, the, the rulemaking was open. In track one of the proceeding, um, the CPUC addressed some nearer term issues with microgrids by streamlining some interconnection rules for microgrids um, and also modified the existing net energy metering tariff for resiliency to better accommodate resiliency needs by removing storage sizing limits and changing the tariff to allow storage devices to charge from the grid in anticipation of a PSPS event, which was really key because that will allow storage to be fully charged in advance of a, um, a PSPS event. Um, within that track one, the PUC also approved PG&E's community microgrid enablement program, and also recently approved a tariff to support that, and that authorized 60.75 60 million in matching funds for distribution upgrades and related measures to support the islanding function of any microgrid requested by a community during an outage. So that's a program that PG&E has developed and they did develop a tariff to support that, which will provide some benefits to, co to communities, but it didn't resolve any of the issues that I mentioned earlier as far as third party and commercialization of microgrids on a broader basis. In track two, um, the CPUC did direct the IOUs to develop microgrid tariffs, but those tariffs were limited um, to a single customer establishing a microgrid at a single account and that are interconnected under Rule 21 with resources that qualify under the current net energy metering tariff. And that lim really limits the technologies that qualify for that tariff, really primarily to solar and storage, which the projects that uh, Neil has talked through all meet the requirements of, of that tariff but we would like to see um, a tariff that expands broader technologies across a, um, to provide more extensive resiliency solutions to customers that require those. Um, within track two, the staff, or excuse me, the CPUC also adopted um, the allowance for 10 critical facility projects in each utility service territory to be able to tr transmit power between facilities during an outage, but they must install equipment prohibiting parallel operation during normal conditions. So they move the ball forward a little bit on being able to serve adjacent parcels with power, but that would only be during outages. But that represents some progress there. Um, within that track, they also created a $200 million ratepayer funded microgrid incentive program, which I've noted here on the slide. Um, and I wanted to call that out for those who may want to get involved in those discussions because that is ongoing right now. It is focused on critical public facilities and communities that are at higher risk of electrical outages. Um, single projects are excluded from this. So it's really targeting more complex microgrids and um, it's being led by the investor owned utilities as well as the environmental justice community. And that discussion is ongoing currently around how that program will be designed and how uh, projects will qualify and so on. For As far as a third party developer like us is concerned, that could allow us to contract with the utilities to design and, and build a project, but it doesn't move the ball forward on any of the other issues that I touched on. Within track two, the CPUC also formed the CPUC Resiliency and Microgrid Working Group to address, to have ongoing discussion at a deeper technical level 
on regulatory issues around microgrids that we haven't yet resolved. So that is currently ongoing. And in fact, tomorrow we have a meeting to talk about the value of resiliency. So if anybody's interested in that, please tune in. Um, we did just complete track three. And within track three, um, the CPUC did su suspend the capacity reservation component of the standby charge for specific eligible microgrids that meet specific carb distributed generation standards. So um, that is what we got out of track three and we expect track four to open soon. And we do expect resiliency and a value for resiliency to be in scope in track four. So we're looking forward to that discussion. Another proceeding that I want to note that I think is of interest is the CPUC recently released a order to institute rulemaking on a uh, proceeding to modernize the grid for a high distributed energy resource future. And we do expect this proceeding to address issues that do impact microgrids. And within this proceeding, this has a pretty broad scope that they're going to consider increasing community engagement with distribution planning and investigating the roles of a distribution operator um, among other topics. So that is going to be a very interesting proceeding. So definitely tune into that if that is of interest. Um, I want to touch on lastly kind of what other active policy initiatives are ongoing in the California legislature currently we had a number of bills that were focused on microgrids and resiliency, but most of them got scaled down significantly to where they weren't really relevant for microgrids or they just didn't make it, I didn't move forward. One bill that is still active is SB 99, which is the Community Energy Resiliency Act authored by Dodd, Senator Dodd. And that is still active in the legislature and that would require the commission to develop and implement a grant program and the commission, by the commission I mean the a California Energy Commission to develop and implement a grant program for local gov governments to develop community energy resilience plans that would include microgrids. This bill only take it, takes it to the planning level, unfortunately not to the implementation level, but this is some progress for those communities to uh, move forward with plans around microgrids. There's also a lot of activity at the federal level um, you know, it's part of larger climate package that could represent some additional fundings for microgrids moving forward at the federal level. In conclusion, with all this, I'll say climate and resiliency policy is going to continue to be a high priority for lawmakers, especially with support from the Biden administration. And um, the, the discussion around commercialization of microgrids and, and development of new rules is going to continue at the PUC through 2020, 2021 and beyond. Um, and lastly, you know, bioenergy, hydrogen, and other clean fuels, I think will be an increased focus as we move forward, as policies are developed to um, continue to develop um, and promote clean, reliable alternatives to fossil fuels. And with that, I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Margaret. And I, I just want to mention, you know, policy is so key. So thank you for covering that. And I think some of the questions that we're getting in have to do with that. I just want to mention, I believe that bill you were referring to was 1339, not 1139. I think there was a little typo there. So oops, I think 1139 was the anti-net engineering yes. bill. <laughs> so Can you tell I'm still traumatized over that one? Um, <laughs> sorry about yes. that typo. You're right, it's, it's better than our brains. Um, great, well, thank you all for your great presentations. If the presenters could get off mute, we have some questions coming in and I'd like to get to those now. Um, so I think some of these, like I said, really do have to do with policy because that is the biggest hurdle that we encounter in deploying these projects. So there are a few related questions and I'll just read them out now. Um, Terrence Hill, advisor and board member at PHIUS, not sure what that is, asks, why is there no discussion of microgrids at the city block scale? Uh, Rebecca Bryson, director of the Energy Coalition, asks, for school options, is it connected to other buildings in the summer, holidays, and weekends when school is not in session but community energy needs are high? And Van Rainey, activist at EBCPA, asks, is, 
Santa Barbara school systems, each campus standalone, or can schools deliver service to other schools across property lines? And I, I think this gets to the issue we run into a lot. You know, we're we're helping facilitate a lot of solar microgrids at individual facilities. Connecting them into community microgrids requires policy fixes. So maybe you all could speak to that. And and I see, yeah, some of you are still on mute. So go ahead and get off mute. And Margaret, do you want to reiterate the the rule that limits um, across border? So, is that, or I guess to translate the technical, the technical is right now a microgrid is limited to a meter. So, if multiple bu buildings are on one meter, then we can support you know a system to, to support multiple buildings. But it's it's limited to the meter. Um, you cannot sell um, energy savings or or energy services to multiple meters with one project and that's something that you know we could definitely use the community support on as a, as a developer we're active in those negotiations as is our, our responses as is in clean coalition but um that we violate the utilities um, monopoly status if we're providing services um to more than one um building That is, that's why we're not looking at city level. And that's specific to here in California. Different states have different laws. Um, but that is but that is the challenge of why we're not looking at city level resiliency um, projects. Yeah, any other thoughts on that? I know this is a big issue. Uh, we have another question from that. You know, it's an issue that, uh, you know, those of us in the microgrid community are going to continue to push on. It did come up as potentially in scope and track two of the PUC's proceeding, but it was, you know, as I mentioned, there was some minor advancements made, but that's an issue that we're going to have to continue to push on to um, advance. Rosanna, can you repeat the second question that you you mentioned there? I don't feel like I addressed we addressed that part. That was for school options. Is it connected to other buildings in the summer? Um, yeah. Oh, so. So what we found is actually most a lot of these schools and that's part of the site selection process are in operation during the summer. So they may be servicing servicing different community functions and that's part of the site selection process. So they're not serving the, the energy assets are not serving other loads. They are continuing to serve um, the buildings that they are they're, where they're co-located. Great, thanks. And, and of course, these schools also serve as emergency shelters. So during an outage. Whenever that happens, they'll be ready. Um, here's a related question from David Brown, principal engineer at SMUD. Single customer microgrids are relatively straightforward, but many proposed multi-customer microgrid locations are along utility, local, and mainline circuits that serve customers well beyond the microgrid bounds. How can these microgrids isolate without impacting unrelated customers? What if a project uh, what if project isolation impacts the greater area resiliency? Yeah, so this is, you know, so that, that is kind of the issue. And um, so th there are a few examples to, to date, like with the Redwood, I think it's the Redwood County Airport, where there were, you know, for these multi-property microgrids today, you, where it is along a, a utility feeder, for those projects today, it's, it's critical that the utility is part of that, and that's the only way they can happen. So as, as the comment mentioned, the utility uh, infrastructure has to be used to kind of isolate the, um, the microgrid portion. So there, there are a few cases where, um, let's say, a, a utility feeder runs down the street for several blocks, and you know maybe there's a microgrid that only has businesses on one block. So there are ways the utility can use um, automated switching devices to, you know, to isolate that in the event of an outage. But then, you know, once the grid comes back, it has to, you know, get all the customers back up and running. So it does take extra coordination to make sure that everything is safe uh, for the community and, and and we're not, you know, adversely impacting, you know, other customers of the utility. Uh, so I'd like to ask going to say something, but if not, I'll move on. Um, Robert Perry, principal at con uh, consultant at Synergistic Solution, asked, do your microgrades 
contemplate future proofing through incorporation of EVs and emerging vehicle grid integration technologies. Schools in particular are good projects as EV buses can charge during the day. And I know that the solar microgrids at the Santa Barbara Unified School District are being done with carports and they'll be ready for EV chargers to be installed. Uh, do you have anything to add to that? Yes, we are concurrent. While we're working on the resiliency uh, microgrid offering, we have a concurrent offering around electrification of school bus fleets. Um, often the, the depot for the buses is not at the same location um, as the, the school microgrids. And so um, that is something that we, can be contemplated, but we haven't seen um, in fruition um, yet. And the other thing is for the electric bus tariff, they have to be on a separate load. They can't be on the same load as the buildings. So while we think that there's opportunities for a vehicle to grid, the vehicle to grid plus resiliency offering um, needs some regulatory tweaks as well. Great, thanks. Um, we have just a couple minutes left. I want to just um, cover something that other people might be wondering about too. Hari Lamda, coordinator at Brighter Climate Futures, asks which projects are already operational. I know some are in the works. Um, could you maybe clarify which ones are already operational and which ones are still being? Sure. So, so out of the five that we shared today, uh, the ANZO electric microgrid is is up and running. Uh, there was actually a, a recent article, I think in the last week or so, on microgrid knowledge on that one as well. Um, and the Adventist Health Feather River site is mechanically complete. We're still going through a few tweaks on the commissioning side. The other sites, uh, Santa Barbara is completing the engineering right now. It should be starting construction here in the next couple months. And then both the yet to be named water district and Solana County are, are just getting underway with the heavy engineering. Great, thank you. Um, and I think this is a good one too. And from Tony Lumino, can the cost of a microgrid be included in the power purchase agreement? And uh, I think, you know, these power purchase agreements in, in include all those costs and can save the facility's money, so maybe you can speak to that a little bit. As long as, as the, uh, go ahead, Neil. Well, so it, it is possible, but there is the, the, what we found is that um, depending on the the size and the scope, it may be possible, but it may be necessary to break out some of the cost into separate capacity charges. And, and the reason in doing that is that we have to make sure that the PPA has to be at a market rate. So even if the customer does recognize there's value in resiliency and, they, and that they are going to pay a premium for it, sometimes those financiers and those tax equity firms aren't willing to finance something that is above what they deem to be market. So, uh, so it, it's possible to put in all into one PPA, but some portions may need to be broken out into like a annual capacity payment and that would be in conjunction with your ppa so i don't know if that's where you were going rachel but yep yeah the ppa rate has to be lower than your current energy price your current energy bill for yeah. finance mm -hmm. that makes sense well thank you i know some of you have to get on to other things so thanks again for all your presentations I want to thank everyone for joining our webinar today. And as I mentioned, we will email everyone the webinar recording and slides within a couple of business days. We will also post the recording and slides on our website under events, where you can also find upcoming events. So thank you all and have a great day.